Hello, everyone. Um, one of my students um, asked me to show some games by some of the top players in the world, and I decided to follow his request. Um, and one of the reasons to look at players uh, at the games of the players so good is you get to see how they think, you get to see how they come up with plans, you get to see how they come up with ideas. And we're going to look at the game played by Gary Kasparov. We looked at one of his games a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a game he played against arguably one of the best defenders in the world, Ulf Anderson. Um, and let's take a look. Kasparov with white pieces. d4, knight f6. c4, e6. And white has a choice between knight c3 and knight f3. Knight c3 will, on the highest level, a lot of the time lead to the Nimzo Indian. And so, on the highest level, sometimes people who want to avoid the Nimzo Indian will play knight f3, which is what Kasparov does here. And now black has a choice. He can play d5 and get back to the queen's gambit. He can play c5 to get into a version of the Benoni. Uh, or, like in this game, you can play b6, which is the queen's Indian. And white has many choices here. Um, he simply plays a3. It restrains his bishop. It doesn't give him this square after something like knight c3. Uh, and white's plan is to eventually control the center. If he's, as you see, this bishop does not have a lot of very good squares right now. So black continues with his idea of bishop b7, which makes perfect sense. Kasparov develops the knight, and Anderson plays a very natural move, knight e4. At first, if you know anything about chess, you will you will note that this moving the knight twice in the open is not the greatest idea in the world. However, in this case, it makes a lot of sense. Because A, at some point, white wants to play queen c2, pawn e4. Um, so black is stopping it. And B, a lot of the time he wants to play f5 and take control over the light squares combined with the bishop. So knight e4 by Anderson. Um, Kasparov takes. Anderson takes back. And now a very nice move by Kasparov, knight c2. Um, at first it looks weird why you move in the knight, but the point is we attack in the bishop, but we're also preparing to play e4, and we're also preparing to play f3 e4 sometimes. Or maybe even e4 f4, which is <clears throat> less logical, but at the same time might sometimes make sense. Now Black wants to keep this bishop alive, and the question is, does he return back home? Or does he go back here and stay on this diagonal? And Anderson decided to go with bishop g6. But now, since black uh, moved b6 and got his bishop away, away from this diagonal, Kasparov decides to get his bishop there. Okay, black plays knight c6, um, developing move, and Kasparov plays e3. Well, the pawn is attacked. It looks like a clumsy move by the knight, but the problem for white is how do you deal with this? Uh, if you move knight 3 well, you just spent a lot of time moving your knight back and forth. Um, if you move knight b3 well, this knight is not so great. Uh, sometimes white might want to push b4 and play bishop b2, and this knight does not make sense here. If white plays e3, which he did in the game, well, now the light squares are becoming a little bit cool. Um, and this is why Black did this, and it justifies, at least in his opinion, the fact that his knight is a little misplaced. Um, so e3. Um, and Black played a slightly weird move here. He played a6. Um, he has some ideas of playing b5, but uh, at some point. But this is a very, very slow move. Uh, 
maybe also knight a7 right here, but the knight doesn't really want to be on a7. Uh, and here Kastrov decides to gain more space on b4. Uh, just gain more space. And black knight b5, which at first looks weird because this pawn is attacked twice uh, by the pawn and the bishop. And there is only one defender. So the question is, why is he doing this? What's the point? Um, well, I'm going to pause. I'm going to ask you before I pause, what do you think is the plan for black if white takes twice? And the answer is, uh, it opens up this rook. So if white takes twice, black will be able to take this pawn. So in other words, takes, takes, takes. And now black can take here using this pin. So what did Kasparov do? Well, <clears throat> Kasparov took once and then put his bishop on b3. Because now he's threatening to take and the rook is now defended. And so black needs to deal with this. Uh, he uh, needs to defend this pawn. Um, and he plays a really weird move, knight a7. Well, at least he can maybe move this pawn at some point, but black knight does not make too much sense. And Kasparov plays a move which a lot of people would not consider in this position. Um, if you alpha 0, you will of course play this move, and Kasparov plays it on h4. Um, asking this bishop how comfortable he's going to be on the square. Um, the point is simple, we can try to trap it. Something like h5, and if he plays here, then g4. And this bishop is running out of squares. So black plays h6 to give his bishop, to give his bishop an escape square. Um, and now most people in this position would play a very natural move pawn, bishop g2. Um, uh, but Kessler realized something. He said, well, if I play bishop g2, but I will play d5. And the problem I have is this bishop is blocked and this bishop is blocked. One of the things you want to do when you play chess, you want your pieces to be active. So Casper here <clears throat> plays a very, very creative move. He plays d5, he gives up a full pawn. But his point is A, he's activating this bishop. But B, he is getting his other bishop on this diagonal. So let's see what happens. Pawn, pawn d5. Well, black takes free pawn. He's up a pawn, but one of the problems now, this bishop is really good. And if black wants to pass, so then he needs to move this bishop. The problem is, if he moves this bishop, well, this pawn becomes free. So that creates some problems. Castro plays bishop g2 right away, attacking this pawn. Black defends. Pawn c6, and Kasparov simply castles. And the problem for black is he's up a pawn, but it's not so easy for him to get his king to safety. And white is getting ready to open the middle and go after the skin. So black plays f6, um, restraining this bishop, allowing for this guy to come out. But there are a few issues which this move creates. And white first plays rook e1, uh, continue with his plan to open up the black king. Well, black wants to castle, he moves his bishop to e7. Uh, but now there is a very good move that white has. Um, I'm going to pause and let you see if you can find it. If you're a French player, you will know this idea right away. It is queen g4. And the point is, once this bishop moves, this pawn becomes weak. This bishop is attacked. If the bishop moves, well, um, there is a free pawn. So black needs to defend the bishop, king f7. But the another problem behind moving to f6 is black light squares are becoming a little bit weak. White drives the bishop back to h7 with pawn h5. And now opens the middle. And the problem for black is he's up a pawn, but his knight is out of play. His king is a little bit weak, 
And white pieces are becoming more and more active. <clears throat> so pawn e4, um, black takes, and now white has a decision. Do we take with the bishop or the knight, both of which look very sensible? And Castro takes with the bishop. The reason is, as we mentioned, black has these weak light squares. The bishop is helping to protect those squares. So white is trying to get rid of this bishop to get access over here and maybe over here. Um, this is an important idea to remember. Um, when your opponent has, is defending, uh, see which pieces he has which are playing an important role in his defense and see if you can eliminate them. So Castro decides to eliminate this bishop. Okay, black takes. Otherwise, we might take and come in with the queen. So black takes. <clears throat> White takes back with the knight. And black realizes his knight on a7 makes zero sense. So he tries to bring it back into the game. Knight c8. And Kasarov brings in his last piece. White pieces are extremely active right now. Um, the knight is sitting in the middle of the board, the rooks are on open lines, the queen points in these directions, the bishop is uh, shooting across the board, the knight is in the middle. Uh, rook d1, of course, attacked the spawn, so black needs to deal with this. Uh, he plays rook a7. It looks weird, but the logic is at some point the spawn will move, and this rook will be able to defend the cross. Uh, and now this is important. A lot of the time when you're attacking and there is no way to continue to build up your attack, and you already have a number of pieces in the attack, you need to start looking for sacrifices. And Castro, well, he found one of them. Knight takes f6. Okay. In the game, black took with the pawn. Let's look for a second what happens if bishop takes. Okay, so if bishop takes, <clears throat> play queen g6. This game has two squares. If he goes here, we have a simple tactic. I will pause and let you find it. It is just bishop, it is just rook e8, winning the queen. Uh, so black has to play here. Of course, now rook e8 does not work because it's just a free rook. Uh, but now black might trade bishops. Black has to take back with a pawn. If it takes with the queen, well, the square is open again, and white has a checkmate, takes checkmate, uh, or with the queen. So black has to take with the pawn. And now there is a beautiful, beautiful move for white, which is completely crushing. It's not an easy move to find, so uh, please pause and try, try your best to find it. If you do, it will be really satisfying. Uh, the move is a very, very pretty rook e6. And the logic is black cannot pay because of the spin. But the points we are simply double attacking the pawn, and it's impossible to defend it a second time. Um, and once we take the pawn, the skin is going to get checkmated. It just there is no there is no way to stop it. So let's go back. So when Kasparov sacrificed, black took back with a pawn. Okay. Let's expect the queen g6. The king drops back to f8. And now Castro plays a very slow move. He repositions his bishop and looks at this pawn. Um, and again, black is up a piece, but um, this rook and this knight are not protecting the king. This king is open. White rooks are still amazing. Um, bishop c1 is a very nice move. Okay, black can't defend the spawn really, so he tries to bring his rook to defend. Uh, pawn d5. And now most people would take this right away, but Kasparov says, I don't have to do this immediately. And this is important. Sometimes if you have a good move, you want to play it right away, but ask yourself, can I still play that move later? If I can, is there something even better I can do? And Castro finds that move. He brings the rook up with the idea to swing across, maybe here, 
maybe here, um, and improve his attack. And white pieces, again, are working very, 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 very hard here. Um, Black Knight is trying to join the defense of the king, but Kasparov contains with his attack, rook g4. It looks the knight comes here just in time to defend the spawn, so now white cannot take. But just when it seems the pawn is defended, Kasparov takes it right away. Um, so, <clears throat> um, obviously, black cannot take this rook. The reason is simple. I will pause for a second and let you find it. The point, of course, is queen will checkmate because the rook does not cover the square anymore. If knight takes, white will just fork and fork. And he will be winged after the king moves. The bishop cannot block, it's illegal. So after the king moves, white takes this up and white is just up and rook for a bishop and also up a pawn. It's completely winged. So it's very interesting. Black cannot actually take. Well, he's in check. He's in check. He has to move. King g8. And now uh, just very, very simple move by Kasparov. He moves the bishop to g7, he attacks this rook, and here black actually resigned, despite being up a piece. The point is, if he plays rook g8, we're going to move our pawn, we're going to move our pawn again on the next move, and we're threatening this rook, and some sort of queen will take place. Um, and this is just completely, completely win for white. Also, it's very interesting to see how black is up a piece, but he's completely tied down. This rook has no squares. This knight is pinned. This bishop is pinned. Um, and white pieces are extremely active. So remember some of the lessons of this game. Uh, going back to the middle, when Kasparov played a move d5, I'm not saying you should go around sacrificing your pawns, but remember, peace activity is very important. And Castro gave up a full pawn because A, he wanted his bishops to play, but B, he believed that the, this bishop is going to prove very, very, very annoying for his opponent. And the second point to remember, when all your pieces are doing their best, let's say in um, this position, um, Start looking for sacrifices. If there is no way to improve your attack, if you're already attacking with a number of pieces, see if you can sacrifice one of them to be able to break through. And the last point that I wanted to remember, when you're attacking, try to get rid of your opponent's defending pieces. A couple of moves ago, Kasparov realized that this bishop was playing an important role protecting the king, and so he brought his bishop in in order to get rid of this bishop. So I hope you enjoyed this game. I hope you learned something. Please like, please subscribe, and I will be back in a couple of days. Thank you.